Dear Earthmates, today we are visiting Dr. Nikki Depina, or Veronica Depina, Depina. Uh, but uh, uh, Veronica is a beautiful name, but Nikki is also wonderful. And when I you know Dr. Nikki Depina, <laughs> you know, world, it's easy to remember. And uh, thank you for accepting this invitation. Uh, Nikki, if I may say. Uh, yes, of course. Yes. Um, we owe our new friendship to our mutual friend, uh, George Onsi from Cairo, Egypt, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Renaissance uh, Millennium III. Um, you uh, initiated. Uh, global Peace, Let's Talk uh, Network. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, would you please uh, tell us about yourself? That's uh, the most difficult question, of course. <laughs> okay, about myself. Um, I've always been an activist. Um, I've ended up in situations where it become really natural for me to fight for what I felt was wrong. Um, so I actually grew up in Zambia, in Africa, and uh, the love of, of openness and, uh, and people, you know, the, the realness of people in Africa during that time in the 1970s uh, had a huge impact on my life. From there, we moved to, um, at the time it was called Rhodesia, uh, but there was a war going on. There was a war going on to change uh, uh, Rhodesia. The British Commonwealth decided uh, that it needed to go back to Africa, but uh, we were very much at the crux, the core of the war there. And, one of the things that uh, struck home for me was the way that uh, the interracial communications between the soldiers, the soldiers that were fighting with uh, with Ian Smith in Rhodesia, uh, were, were so connected. There was a lot of respect going on uh, between them. So there wasn't any uh, racial issues then. Uh, in the in the actual army of of Rhodesia, but change needed to come, and uh, and uh, Rhodesia then became Zimbabwe uh, under the leadership of uh, Mugabe. And at that time, uh, we left uh, and we moved to um, South Africa. And South Africa, uh, when when we got there, was extremely political. It was a very harsh country. The, the rules between black and white, not being allowed to walk where you want to walk or sit down if your legs were tired because it was a white's only place to sit. Um, coming from a country like uh, Rhodesia, all of this was very new to me because it didn't happen there. But trying to adjust to a life of such harshness and, and bitterness and hate um, uh, made my whole life change to fighting for those um, that were being discriminated against. And one of the stories uh, that stuck with me, I was actually standing in a post office, um, and there was a long queue. In those days, we didn't have internet, you know, those old days, you still went to the post office <laughs> to post your letters and that. But anyway, uh, there was a black man in front of me um, in farm clothes, so he obviously worked on a farm. He was trying to post a letter that was important, but he didn't know how to write. So he asked the lady nicely, at the counter, if she could just help him, and he had the paper with her dress on, if she could just help him. And she just turned around and, and said to him, I'm not here to do your dirty work for you. You write that yourself, you're wasting my time. And she shouted at him, and he stood there like he didn't know 
he didn't know how to respond or what to do because he had done nothing wrong. He asked a very simple question. Could you write this for me? Um, and I was right behind him, so I asked him just to move aside and I went uh, at the counter and I said to her, in all my years, at that time I was still young, but I still said to her, in all my years, I have never ever experienced such blatant hate and discrimination. I said, all this man is asking you for is to help him right. And you turn around and insult him like that. So there was a there was a conversation between me and her, um, and I then uh, said to her, "You will wait now until I've done this letter." So I helped with the letter, and then I asked her please to go and fix her supervisor or her boss or whoever was in charge of her, and I explained to him what had happened, and that could you please see that this important letter was posted. So that was, a, that was really a beginning of a struggle for me in South Africa. Because I was then new to South Africa. But then I became an activist for peace, for the struggle. Um, and uh, through my work, I ended up... Um, um, I, I, I'm actually not quite sure how it happened, but I think uh, people were noticing certain things that I was doing. And I actually got put into an uh, organization where uh, they were asking me to do certain things to help. So at the time, um, I was working for the only powerhouse in South Africa, it's called ESCOM. And ESCOM is, is the key for South Africa, for power, for electricity, huge organization. And I then started working for ESCOM, and I was appointed then um, where I was working uh, with staff that uh, where there were problems, like almost like a social worker, and helping staff uh, with their, their problems. So during that time, Mandela, the talk of Mandela being released, was being discussed with government long before the release. And uh, Esther was a key role player in that transition, a key role player. So uh, part of my work with Esther at the time was to look at the issues going on between uh, black and white uh, and where you would find that no blacks were appointed in leadership positions, you see? Uh, and if there were issues, like in the workshop, where the supervisors were all, at that time, all of them were white, and all of them had their own way of thinking, um, and they were hard, hard made. There was no kindness in their approach. Um, so part of my role was to work with that and see what could be done. So one of the, one of the projects that Eskim initiated uh, with uh, support from government. You know, there was a lot going on in the background with the change that was coming to South Africa. Lots of things were going on that we never spoken about. But they were tossed, Eskom was tossed for breaking down discrimination. So uh, one of the projects that they had, uh, they actually brought leaders from different countries to South Africa. For one of the projects was to take uh, the mixed, mixed races on what they called team building session. And that's a never team building. Team building. Team building. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And this had never happened before. If, if there were team building projects, white people went off on their team building project, you know? And if, and if black people went off on their own, but this was a racially integrated mix now for the first time ever. And uh, I was, uh, we were three people, three people that were selected in Eskom to work on these projects. And we were actually sent away for a long time of things I can't always uh, um, share, but we were sent away to get training on how to manage all of this. 
So all from the team building, uh, we win. And you can imagine for the first time, all these right supervisors now having to sleep together in the same room, eat off the same table, uh, share uh, the same swimming pool. All of those things were happening during the session to break down the barriers. And in between, there was a group process going on to discuss uh, the differences and the hurts. And it was incredible, Derek. It was truly, uh, again, huge impact in my life because for once, for once, uh, people could see white people in South Africa could try and understand that there was uh, another human just saying, hello, can you, can you just see me? Because I'm also a human. And I also have a right to have a voice. And I'm like you, I also have family and I have children and I go to church and I work hard so that I could have a future. And the, 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 the differences were being broken down. And the life went on in a lot of people that were on those sessions. Some people were problematic, they were difficult. And others just suddenly the light came on and they understood. And of course, that supported the change that came to South Africa. It did a great deal of support. Because one of the first things that happened um, when Mandela was released was that all the schools became multiracial. You see, when you only had white schools, suddenly uh, black children were allowed to go to the same school. There were a lot of changes. You could eat in the same restaurant, you could walk down the same street, you could sit on the same bench. It was a life change. And uh, the, the inspiration that I knew that I was making some sort of difference stuck with me up to today. My entire life is against discrimination and unfairness and judging people on their religion or their culture, or their race. And that has been my life's journey. And that's where it started. And what is a wonderful thing that happened to me is that I actually got to meet some of the very hard, um, hard profile people that were doing the change in South Africa. And, and the blessing that I got was very simple. It was just this, thank you, Nikki. Wow. Just thank you. Just thank you. Nothing else. No, uh, you know, yes, money, yes, uh, words, yes, anything. It was just thank you. But the thank you had such depth. It was so real and so powerful that I knew then that my journey would also follow, always follow that dream. So uh, after leaving uh, South Africa, being married, having children, um, that is when I, I focused on where there were peace initiatives where I could add support. And that's what I did. I worked for four different uh, peace, uh, international peace associations. The strongest and the most touching one for me was uh, with Dr. Luda Amori, the International Institute of Peace Through Tourism. Because Dr. Amori believed that tourism breaks down barriers. And they do. Because once you've been to a country and you understand the culture and the people, then you're not that judgmental. Tourism. Tourism. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yes. Tourism is a catalyst for peace. So I enjoyed working with Dr. Amori. He was a very passionate, uh, passionate leader. Um, I know he's, he's, he's quite old now, and I know he's busy retiring, but I've always had great love for him because of the work that he did. And he never had men. Dr. Jamori just did what he could do with what he had, and it impacted the world in tourism. So uh, that is when then uh, uh, I decided then, with all the experience and everything I've done, I decided to open Global Peace-led Talk, 
uh, simply because I believe that if we can talk about the differences and we can understand each other and we can also be sensitive uh, to people that are really struggling, Terry, people in Africa, you know, uh, in Global Peace they talk, one of, the, one of the, the strongest, the anchors of global peace, why I'm so determined, is that in the worst of situations in Africa, where the poverty is with such depth, there, there is so much hunger and suffering, that you would think, what can I do to make a difference if I don't have money to contribute? But what these young people are doing in those environments, they are refusing to be broken. They stand up on their own with no support in that community and they start an initiative. And one of the initiatives is to take the children, uh, uh, the children that are only having one meal a day, that they will take them and put them together and they will say to them, Let's play. Let's draw. What makes you sad? I love you. You matter to me. And they're doing things like that. And the, the gatherings are just growing. And then they're talking to women that are being very badly abused. Because in countries where there are conflict, the violence against women is stronger than at any other time because those women are taking a backlash of suffering. And the backlash is abuse, verbal, rape, uh, all in that area. So the women are suffering. But these young people will gather the women and they'll say, let's do something so that for an hour a week, you are just a human and we can make peace. So my respect for these young people is just, that is global peace, let's talk, love. Uh, the whole passion is based on these young people who have a right to life. And I want to see these young people being recognized. Um, global peace, let's talk, does not have any fun. Uh, it's only... This year, we're going to try to get some funding together because I would like to say to these young people, for your project, here's money for paper and crayon. And that's all they're asking. Can I have some paper and crayon so the children can color? Because art, art has a, a nature of peace. And if a child can play with paper and crayons and draw, and I'm going to send you some pictures of what the children did that never, ever had any lesson in art at all. They don't go to school, but they can draw the most beautiful pictures because they love the crayons in their hand and the feel of the paper, you see? And then on top of that, they still get a glass of cool drink if they're lucky. Then when they attend these little sessions, they get cool drink. When the women attend the sessions uh, to support them, they will get tea or something. Whatever the leader has to share, they will share. And that is my passion at the moment, to give recognition to these peace leaders that are using their own initiative through the art, to sharing love, to teaching a very basic skill like sewing or Baking. Oh, let me tell you, in the refugee camp in Uganda, there's a young man who had, he's a refugee, had nothing, but he knew how to bake. So what did he do? He started a little bakery, this tiny little bakery, a bakery. Sorry, yeah. baking, did you say? A bakery, where you bake, you learn, you bake cakes. Yes, a confectioner, a bakery, yes, yeah. Yes. And he started this, started this bakery with no money. He just started small, but the bakery grew until he could have a shop. Now he's got a proper bakery. But what does he do? He takes the children from the street and they come to him 
on a day a week and he teaches the children to bake. Now, you see, when you want to talk about peace initiatives, you're looking at an action. And these young people are using whatever skill they have to initiate little programs like this. And that is what Global Peace is about. It's about sharing love and well, recognition. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, uh, in a minute, uh, this uh, will stop, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, will you please um, send me uh, your bio note or CV so that I can add it and with other information? Mm -hmm. And um, your presence, your activities are wonderful. Uh, you are an ideal earth mate. And uh, <laughs> of course, you are cordially invited to the Earth's uh, Civilization Network. Uh, Earthmates, Earthmates Cafe, we meet uh, every two weeks. Uh, so we're together. Thank you so much. We'll go on another day. Another day. Yes. One more talk. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Tony. Thank you. We're together, Nikki. Take care. Namaste. Namaste. Yes. Take care.